Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel for our FOSDEM Legal and Policy Dev Room on Compliance. This has become somewhat of a staple for our Dev Room. Uh, we're doing it, of course, remote this year because of the pandemic, but we have a couple of great panelists that are going to dig in today to discuss the issues of doing GPL compliance with a focus on what happens for the customers, the users, the individuals who get devices? How do we assure that they have the source code they're supposed to get under copyleft licenses that it works? And we're going to talk about it from a number of different perspectives from folks all over the industry. I have joining us today, first of all, John Sullivan, the executive director of the Free Software Foundation. We have Davide Ricci, the Director of Open Source Technology Center at Huawei. We have Eilish Nilonigan, also known as Pidge, who is the CEO and CTO of Togen Labs and the Chief Architect of Network Grade Linux. And coming to us from the legal side, we have Miriam Bellhausen, who's a lawyer at Bird and Bird and focuses on copyright law. So to get started, I, I, I would like to start with asking John a question because John, you work for and, and are the principal person at the organization that started the whole idea that software freedom was an important issue way back in 1985. And we're really the first to talk about why it's important. So can you tell us a little bit about why the issues of compliance with copyleft, copyleft licenses fit so directly and importantly with the issues of the compliance requirements, the details in those licenses that uh, companies and redistributors have to follow. Uh, sure. And thanks for having me on the panel today. I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of this discussion. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a very special thing about free software that it is designed to have both fully commercial and non-commercial uh, purposes. And so, you know, we, that the FSF view this as a social movement, uh, for sure, with an ethical foundation and, and an ethical mission. Uh, but uh, the, these chances to talk together with the people that are using the software commercially and have experience doing that and hearing their experiences is, is a really important part of that. Uh, so the primary copyleft license, I think that uh, we have in mind is the GNU general public license. And that has a very simple requirement in its face that you have to share when you distribute a program to another person uh, you have to share the uh, source code which is what you know you as a programmer what the programmers that you hire uh, actually use to modify the program and create the program the human readable code uh, and the reason that that's a requirement is because a binary program that's not uh, particularly useful other than for purposes of being able to run it or hand it off to somebody else uh, so they could run it too. If you wanted to understand anything much about how the program works or you want to be able to make changes to it, you have to have the source code for that. Uh, and you know that's the whole reason for free software or its existence is so that users are in control of the devices that they have, the software powered devices that they have, uh, rather than those devices being in control of them. Uh, and if you can't inspect the program that's running on your laptop or your phone or in your car, uh, then you can't actually know what it's doing other than trusting the company that gave you that software, you know, trusting that they're telling the truth. I've seen plenty of examples, unfortunately, where that doesn't pan out. And then second of all, even once you understand it, if you want to be able to, you know, make a change to it, uh, you also you know, need the source code for that. And you know, I think the, the closing key thing here is just that these rights aren't just for programmers. You know, anybody, if they have the source code, can go to a programmer and ask them to make a change for them, just like you can get your car repaired at a mechanic or have someone else fix the HVAC system in your house. So, But you can't do that unless you have the rights to the source code and the freedom to take it to other people and ask them to do things. And, and, and Pidge, that, that's why I want to come to you here, because one of the focuses of your work is, uh, as I understand it, is to help people uh, and, and help those who build these devices, which are these days a lot more complicated than they were when the mm -hmm. these licenses first came out, to actually make that software build and work correctly uh, and, and create these compliant source releases that are required under these licenses. Can you talk a little bit about what you're, you're seeing in your work 
in, in trying to help your clients get that source code right and what the challenges are that they face with regard to the interaction between the details of that software and its source code uh, and their compliance requirements. Right. Um, so a little background here. When people do a lot of software compliance work, they're doing it around one chunk of software. I'm doing it on entire firmware blobs. Um, so entire Linux stacks. And it's complicated because you just, it, it's not, I need to know what software is on it and what the licenses are. You also end up needing to know how it's built and how it's all tied together. Um, so with a lot of my clients, it's initially, why do we need this? Um, and then, you know, can't we just throw out the metadata and just have it that way and not actually provide the source code? They can get the source code from upstreams that conversation. So there's a period of buy-in initially, and then the complicated work happens, which is going through each and every bit, figuring out, you know, which source package is using, you know, because um, one bit of source code or one package may have multiple things that come out of it with various different licenses. So for example, uh, I don't know, I, I use this all the time, Puzzle. Puzzle may have Puzzle, Puzzle Dev, Puzzle Docs, and they're all going to have very different licenses. So it's understanding everything from nuts and bolts all the way from initial build system all the way to how everything's built to how everything's deployed. Um, so there's a lot of uh, teaching developers things that thou shall not do, like static uh, compilations of closed source software against GPL code, which we have to have that conversation. And software developers are clever, and they go, well, what if we do a shim layer in here? No, 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 no. So stop trying to get around that. So there's a lot of education on the corporate side that I end up having to do to teach developers how to do this, how to do this correctly, and how to do compliance activities afterwards. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. And I want, I want to go to Davide now, because what you're, what you're doing is you're looking from inside your company and trying to build up uh, and answer these questions so that your employees know how to do this correctly, how to incorporate uh, free and open source software into your products. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you design that strategy from inside a company uh, to make sure that you're getting that final source release at the end that, as, as Pitch says, is looking at the entire firmware blob and making sure you have what's required for the entire firmware, not just one part. So first of all, the, the, you know, I've done this a couple of times. I've done it at Wind River and I've learned at the Intel OTC uh, school up in Portland. And then I'm not doing this a well way. So first thing that you had to do is just do it first. Even before you start building codes, you know that you're going to be using open source software when you build an operating system. So first thing that you had to think is, how do I ensure the compliance, right? And how do I do it incrementally? Uh, so over time, I mean, initially it was a lot of, you know, guess and let's figure it out, you know, work. Uh, right now we have good standards uh, that are coming out of, for instance, Linux Foundation with the Open Chain standard, which is really industry oriented. Free Software Foundation is helping us a lot, especially in Europe, uh, helping Huawei to actually do it right. Uh, but you know, it's it, it's about, as I said, if you want to go with Open Chain, it's about fun creating a policy, uh, funding the policy. So essentially, you got to make sure that it's funded. There's people to actually follow the policy, uh, train individuals so that developers, managers, they know what the process are, uh, is what their roles is. So that at the end of the day, everybody knows the do's and the don'ts. And then when you start building that bill of material uh, that tells you, hey, in this device, there's this software, these are the licenses, this is the manifest, these are the author, this is the license that we think the software has. Oh, and by the way, a hey, IP analyst, can you go look? Because some licenses were not clear. At the end of the chain, you have the best possible accuracy when it comes to the bill of material. There's no 100% accuracy in business is about, you know, risk and gain. But as a general manager, I don't want to go to market with a big unknown. So at the end of the day is the most accurate bill of material that gets me through. And if there's a red flag that is flagged by, you know, for me, by the team, then, you know, you take a risk-based decision. 
but that's pretty much the process you follow. Yeah. And so you identified risk and that, that brings me to, to want to ask Miriam about, about that question of risk, because ultimately uh, the reason, uh, if there were no requirements in any of the open source and free software licenses that we have, uh, particularly the copyleft ones, no one would worry about any of these questions that Davide is talking about. So Miriam, what, what do you see? We're, we're, we're so many years now into adoption of open source and free software uh, in companies. When you talk to your clients, what, 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 is, what is their legal concern? What is their fear? And on the other side of it, are, are they able to, to, to see it, uh, convert that legal risk into let's make things better uh, for our customers? Like, like where do you see that divide happening in the clients that you're talking to? Yeah, happy, happy to answer that. And uh, also, thank you for having me on this. Um, so uh, to be honest, I think there's a big difference between different types of companies and the risks or the issues that they see. So there are, let's say, um, companies that have been in the software business for a very long time and they've been working, developing with software. They are really knowledgeable already. Um, they know what they're doing, um, maybe kind of like Huawei. Um, and as Davide just said, um, they are looking into this, they are working on strategies, um, they are looking at the software that they're using, they are looking at it from the beginning, um, and they have very specific questions. Um, and they generally also already know how they would handle certain risks. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have more, let's call them traditional companies coming into the software space. Um, that have maybe just built what, whatever device, um, let's say a fridge for years, and now all of a sudden um, the fridge is smart um, and uses a lot more software um, and they are working with a lot more software. And that's really not their core business so far. Um, and they tend to be looking at the software development and the risks, associated, the risk they, they assume open source software has from a totally different perspective. So with these types of companies, you would still hear questions like, well, how can we how can we even use open source software? Um, there's a copy left in there and um, all of that is a really big risk. So you kind of have to find out where do they stand? How far along in this development are they? Um, how much have they looked into this? What type of developers are they working with? How knowledgeable? are they um, and how much are they pushing are there may maybe differences in the different areas they are working in so um yeah that, that's a that's a big spectrum i would say hmm. and, and so i want to connect that up with, with, with to ask john because the when you when you talk about this ri the, the risk reward and the and, and and analyzing that um i think from the activist side you probably look at this a little bit differently uh, so the the reward I, I would I would guess to the activist. I mean, admittedly, I'm an activist too, so I, I know this is true. That the reward is that with copylefted software being in these devices, it means software freedom for people who get the get the devices uh, with the source code correctly. But of course, the risk is the risk of non-compliance, and in your world, that means you, software users don't get freedom. So when you look at this, how do you how do you reconcile all that question of risk and and help to, to educate and explain to people that the, the risk is really a reward because your customers get software freedom. Yeah, and I, I think that it's important for anybody distributing uh, particularly copyleft software to understand that this dynamic is what gave them that software to begin with. And so the risk of non-compliance, you know, on one hand, an important part of it is that you're um, not respecting your your users, your customers, anybody that's receiving the software from you. Um, but you're also sort of uh, in a long-term way undermining your own business model, you know, because this collaboration model is what created the software that you're using and that you're able to ship with your products. And if you're not doing that properly, then you're not enabling uh, possible participation by other people. Um, you're not enabling bug reports. You know, you're not enabling the entire culture that uh, created this thing that you're able to use. Uh, but yeah, it is, you know, for us, it's more than just, uh, I think the rest from a, a very short uh, focused uh, company perspective is possibly being sued or, you know, having to go through a complicated legal conversation with, with somebody. And uh, that is certainly a risk that, that people should worry about. And one of the things that we do is enforcement at the FSF on the GNU software that we hold copyright over. Um, but really, you know, we want everybody to participate in this process and treat these 
this process is something that benefits them uh, and you know creates a level playing field where no competitor of yours is getting an advantage either by skipping out on some of the requirements here. So I want to go go back to Pidge uh, because uh, that that interesting thing about the competitor uh, issues. One of the important things uh, about uh, free software and copyleft in particular is it assures that everybody's on equal footing. So Pidge, when you're looking at this as from an embedded side of building these firmwares and checking the compliance of the firmwares and checking they build, what what concerns do you have as you're doing the analysis to sort of get to the conclusion of well, d does the source code really work? And you know, are we putting something out there that can actually be collaborated over as far as a technological solution versus just kind of meets the bare minimum of the requirements, which might not necessarily inspire that kind of collaboration? Can you talk a little bit about how that divide gets handled when you're doing this kind of work, uh, both as an upstream and uh, you know, for a client who's asking those questions? Um, so I'm going to plug the project that I work on, Yocto Project, in that I have to, um, because when I wrote the initial pass through the license compliance stuff, and when I was told to write that, I was told, oh, go talk to the lawyers about this. And I'm like, screw that. I'm going to go talk to Bradley because he's the one doing license compliance. You remember the conversation, I'm sure. And I went and talked to the lawyers and then I talked to Bradley and then I was like, oh, okay, this is what he's looking at. Um, so from my perspective, the outputs that Yocto Project gives should also be able to be inputs as well so that people can do this. And it makes sense from an embedded perspective because, you know, if you look at where embedded's going, like if your refrigerator is embedded, you know, refrigerators last, what, 10 years? I don't want to be maintaining firmware for 10 years. I want the community to go out and do it. So from my perspective, it, it, it goes, there. there's compliance at the top of the stack, but it goes all the way down to the bottom of the build system and ensuring that the things that come out of the top of the stack are able for the community to go take those and regenerate them all from scratch. Now, there are folks that do not like doing that. And I tell them to suck it up because, you know, it, it, it makes no sense not to do that. So so I, I, that, that brings me back to, to a couple of things that Davide was saying. So so there is this, and, and uh, you know, I, I always promise I'll ask a few hard questions. So this may be a hard one. So, uh, but, but you mentioned a lot of these initiatives uh, in your initial comments there. Uh, that are out there uh, re related to bill of materials and trying to get just the list of licenses, which I think everybody would agree is the first step you have to do. Um, one of the concerns, and I'll, I'll show, show a little bit of my bias here I've had, is that uh, is, is kind of what Pidge is saying, is, is that that's a, a necessary but not sufficient thing to really get a compliant source code software build. So can you talk a little bit, Davide, how you're treating this inside of a company when you're looking out there to say, well, okay, we, we, we do need to get that bill of materials together, but then we have to get a source release that actually works and that our customers can rebuild and reinstall the software onto our devices in the field, which I think we all agree is a technologically challenging thing to do. How are you looking at that and addressing that when so much of the compliance focus is just on that initial step and sometimes misses that later step? <clears throat> so I think those are complementary uh, uh, matters, uh, and, 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 you know, it, it's hard to just draw a line. Right. And I think it kind of goes back to a couple of things. Number one, why a company is in open source, right? So I think unless you're really 1970s software company that still believes that, you know, the value is in the software itself. I think most of the software companies today has moved past the idea that you monetize the software itself. And it's about monetizing what's on top through value add services, et cetera, et cetera. So in that perspective, software becomes the vehicle to, you know, value add services and monetization. So, I mean, you don't want to take any risks. I mean, you want to be complying until the very end of it, because you actually want me people to use more and more and more of the software that you contribute, because by using that, that becomes the vehicle for you for an upsell. Right. So when the business comes into the picture, now you understand that that's not a cost like screw it. You got to suck it up. No, it's not a cost. It's actually a value. You want to do that. Right. And then as you start doing that, it's kind of natural that you're going to try to 
drive efficiency into the process of this, it's called compliance envelope. So that from the very beginning to the very end, things are, you know, that are added onto that have a piece of information, right? So that this compliance envelope can traverse, right? So, so I think, you know, in general, you know, it's seen as an obstacle or a cost. And I'll tell you something different, right? Or something more It's a cost. If the organization is not mature enough to have figured out what is the business model on top of the code and the source code itself. But the moment that the organization is mature enough to figure out the business, the path to money, then being compliant adds up and helps you actually monetizing and making business. And I'll tell you this is the last thing. You can see the maturity of organization by this question. When you start implementing compliance into an organization that is getting mature, but it's not quite there, the typical thing is, can I just use Fosology? And it's like, uh, kind of, but if this is about your accuracy, then maybe it gets you 20% of the way. How about the red flags and the Christmas tree that now you're going to have to go fix to make sure that the accuracy is high enough, right? And then, oh, I need to staff a team. Yes, you need to staff a team because that's kind of important, right? So if you want to suck it up, you're going to suck it up properly. So get a team on board because that's what you had to do to ensure that compliance envelope accuracy across the board. I, I think I'm going to spend the, the, the next five years paraphrasing Davide to say the mature companies should believe software freedom is part of their business model. Um, so I know that's not exactly what you said, but uh, but you're sort of hinting at that. And I, I really like that. You can, quote me, you can quote me on that. You can quote oh, that's me on wonderful. That. I got to quote you on that for sure. So, so Miriam, I want, I want to come back to you. I, I, the, following up on something that Pidge said that, that I, I really like to hear you comment on. There has been this divide uh, going back to when my career began in the 90s. So it, it predates even dis heavy discussions of, of FOSS compliance of engineers want to do what they want to do and get the product working and lawyers just get in their way. And lawyers give them instructions that don't make any sense. How are you looking at how we're going to do this going forward in the next generation? How do we get lawyers and engineers to talk together as equals who are working together on a team to do the right thing rather than being at odds with each other. Right? How do you see that fitting into the future of, of compliance? Um, I think one part of the solution to that um, might be to actually get lawyers to under understand the technical backgrounds or at least understand the developers that they are talking to. Um, I know there are uh, some some good projects even at university where they start to teach lawyers, you know, at least basics on development and everywhere uh, software development, and they at least have to pick that up. But I, I don't know if that's happening everywhere and enough. Um, but I think that's that's one part of the solution so that you can actually understand what what everyone is saying uh, that you're talking to. Um, the other thing I think is um, again maybe a solution for lawyers they should start offering solutions and not just saying what doesn't work um, and kind of trying to, to get them to find, to get to a solution together maybe. And um, at least I often find that when you explain the background and why some, some things are an issue or are a risk or whatever courts ruled on it differently, um, developers tend to understand that because they they think really, structured and in, in that regard very similarly to lawyers um, so you get to a point where you can kind of get rid of the issues and focus on how you can move forward um, I, I think rather quickly actually um, if you start at a point where you where you understand each other yeah I, I definitely agree with that so so John I want to I want to I want to turn back to you on that question I think one of one of the things that that we've tried to do in the activism world is is that kind of connection you were talking about about why why companies should really see it as their benefit to give software freedom to their users and and, and I, I I so often see and I'm sure we've all seen this where it's going back to Davide's point of the of the mature company uh, not uh, the, the the less mature companies don't get this yet. Um, so how do you see the, the, the words and requirements of the license? Uh, like, like how, what would you say to a company that's not mature uh, that, that, that Davide is referring to? What would you say to them, John, about like to, to get them to stop focusing on just like meeting the bare minimum of the requirements and actually engaging in software freedom in a way that would benefit their company? Yeah, um, it's a question. I mean, I, I think part of it is to 
you know, companies are often concerned about reputation, you know, and I think uh, that's definitely one part of the approach is to discuss that and, um, and, and the fact that this software constructed through sharing really is a, a community and the, it's in the company's interest to be a good citizen within that community and that that will have you know, benefits to them both depending on what you know business sector they're in of course but you know different kinds of benefits to them um one of which being you know when they do make a mistake uh, if they do make a mistake there'll be a lot of you know, community goodwill there knowing that it was a mistake and uh, plenty of people including the free software foundation willing to help um, advise them on how to do things properly, you know, as opposed to just filing a lawsuit. Um, and I think, so that the reputation and that kind of uh, good citizen aspect is important. Um, I would also, you know, point to examples of where uh, new and exciting things have been done as a result of the software being distributed to users. You know, Bradley, you've written about the things that have happened with the router firmware um, from, you know, that source code having to be released uh, since it was built on you know, other GPL code, and that led to um, new software that could be used by companies and, and put in their products and shipped. Uh, so, and then, of course, we want companies to be socially responsible, and I, I think that is a persuasive argument in today's world, especially. Uh, and it's talking to companies about how you know, do you, your employees care about this, your customers care about this, you as a hopefully human being that desires to be ethical in this world should care about this uh, and try to approach it from that standpoint as well. So I think there's you know, kind of all of those, the, the reputation, the, the practical benefits and the, the ethical, socially responsible reasons to talk about. Yeah, so I want to go to go to Pidge then because uh, because Pidge, one, one of the things that I, f I feel, I feel, and you can confirm or deny if this is, if I've got this right, but I feel like when I look at what you're trying to do, you're, you're basically trying to get the details right for what John is talking about. So, and by that, I mean, I see the kind of work you're doing is saying, well, yeah, I want to make it, make companies be socially responsible, do the right thing with compliance, but I want to make it straightforward, easy, and, and designed well for their engineers, like, like build that mm -hmm. connection that Miriam was talking about between the engineers and the lawyers understanding what needs to be done and make it as part of a rote task, like doing good testing on your software and doing you know, other engineering and software development practices. So can you talk a little bit, I, I, and remember that the FOSDEM audience is pretty advanced. So if you can get a little bit sure. into detail of how do you see we do that as a technical matter so that when you, so that someday when you start from Yocto, you know, if I started from Yocto, the thing on the other end is going to be that compliance source release and, and Yocto is going to give it to me or whatever project yep. it is that would give it to me. So I'll give you an example of uh, some of the last people we worked with for the past couple of years and we were doing compliance work with them. Um, every release and they were doing like, you know, scrum sprints. So it was like once every three weeks every release for multiple machine firmware, all of that, and I, I, I'm going to defend Fossology here, it got, <laughs> all of that got generated, thrown up on the Fossology site using the meta license tools layer, and someone went through, and someone who was familiar with, enough with the build system went through and did that work. And we found issues like, you know, because it wasn't a one-off compliance thing. Okay, yeah, we're done, we're released, done. We don't have to do this again. It was a continuous auditing of the entire process and not just auditing, did we go through and create a manifest? It was, did we go through, create a manifest? Did we go through, create a bill of materials? Do are all the metadata in the, the which is the, the scripts that control compilation out there, not just for GPL stuff, but for um, MIT, for BSD, for all of it. Did we ensure that anything that was um, code embargoed because it was closed source license not make it out as well? which is important, you know, because there is closed source stuff on this. And also how much GPL3 is on that because embedded developer, well, not embedded developers, embedded manufacturers don't necessarily like GPL3 because they have difficulty with some of the things if they're trying to do a box that's locked down. Um, so, you know, there was 
this entire process that we had to go through and we went through it once every three weeks and it was continuous. So when we start talking about compliance and thinking about compliance, we have to stop thinking about it as this one-off thing that we do and thinking about it as a continuous integration, continuous test, continuous audit, and continuous testing of the stuff that comes out at the end. Is this usable for the end user? Is this something that's useful? And what happens if Bradley comes knocking on our door? Um, you know, and these are things that we also have to start thinking about and what we were doing with this client of ours. So, so Davide, you're, you're often in the position of being inside the company who would be a client to something like this. And I wanna pick up on something you were saying about the, the mature company will see that this is valuable. One of the things that we haven't really seen yet, because we've seen so much, uh, like we're talking about so much effort going into the bill of materials stuff. We've got uh, it, Pidge sort of doing the, the, the this, this you know, your, your base firmware that you start from uh, AIDS compliance that, that Pidge was just talking about. Uh, but but where do you think, when do you think a company like Huawei can get to the point where it doesn't just want to participate upstream in Linux, like up, the, the, the full upstream, which I know it does, but wants to, be participating in things like let's make a entire firmware that everybody is collaborating on instead of each company doing their own firmware and then that would mean of course less you know going back in and trying to get that firmware into compliance if everybody's using that same firmware base uh, what, how do you think we can get there and can we even get there uh, or is is this divide between upstream and final build going to continue to be so wide no i think it's going to I think it's gonna go on, and and it's it, it's about defragmenting and defragmenting and defragmenting and defragmenting. If I take the Octo project, and I've been lucky enough to be one of the founding father back in two thousand and ten uh, when I was at Wind River, right? So it's, that's how I know uh, our friend here. Uh, and uh, uh, it was about creating one common set of technologies and tools for defragmenting the embedded device industry, meaning that it didn't reinvent the wheel. It didn't recreate the Linux kernel, Bash, Apache, Boa, whatever that is. It didn't reinvent BitBake, but it creates an ecosystem, a sandbox where partners with the same goal in mind, you know, shared that effort so that each and every one of them could benefit in the end. Right. And so that is this broad. Now that goes to Huawei. As a matter of fact, um, uh, my team is responsible for launching in Europe Open Harmony, which is the Huawei led open source initiative to create uh, an operating system that powers consumer devices. Now, if this is Yatso, consumer devices is this. Right. So it's not the entire industry, but it's this. So we are using a leverage in BitBake, Yato LTS. But now we also need to support smaller devices that use Zephyr. That's another project, right? So now we get together consumer companies, device makers, just like Huawei, Samsung, LG, just making names up, right? Just to give an example, Bosch, Siemens, LG, Sony, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're defragmenting the consumer device industry, meaning that you now create something called open harmony, right? But it's an open source play with those company reuse Yachtel tailor it to consumer devices and defragment that industry. And they all participate in that open source project in the compliance activity that, you know, we just mentioned so far. And at that point, once you have consumer companies just working together, right, to defragment the industry, it's very easy because consumer com companies are B2C. So they serve the end consumer and you are at the end of the chain, right? So I think we're going to proceed by defragmenting and defragmenting and defragmenting. And so long as this compliance envelope traverses, this defragmentation effort, you will see participation, but defragmenting has to be there as a business uh, goal, right? If there's no business goal in defragmenting, then participation is not going to be possible. That makes that makes sense to me. I want to I want to go back to Miriam now because when 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 I continue to hear all of all of everybody else here talk, um, I want to sort of see what the lawyers are saying because one of the things yeah. I've noticed is the lawyers are actually end up being on the front lines of this because the first time they realize they have a compliance problem, I'm gonna make a comparison to GDPR, which of course we in the US uh, where I'm based have to comply with because we give services to Europeans. Um, and while even for an organization like the one I work for, where we really care about the goals of GDPR, 
it's still a pain to comply with GDPR. It's still work to be done. And every once in a while, I'm like, oh man, we really have to do our website that while GDPR says we have to. So Miriam, I want to ask you how much, I'm not going to make you say percentages, but give us a sense of are companies where, where Davide is trying to say they ought to be in trying to build these firmwares or are companies coming to still coming to look at uh, open source and free software and saying, Darn, it's annoying thing I have to comply with that I'd rather not have to do. Why do I have to do it? What's what's the majority of what you're seeing and what do you tell them to move them from one side of that to the other? Um, again, uh, as I said before, for you know, what risks do they see? I think the spectrum is just as wide on that area. Um, so I've had clients say, yeah, we are now facing enforcement and Actually, we knew we had a problem there. We should have fixed it. Um, we just didn't have the manpower to do it, um, or we had to focus on GDPR, on whatever else, um, and we had to put our teams there. That's kind of the middle. And then you have on like the upper end of the spectrum, you have companies coming in saying, um, we know there's open source software. We know we are not using it as much yet, but we know we're getting there. Um, we're, we're actually getting into the software business now as well, and we want to comply um, just for the sake of complying, um, because we think it's the right thing to do, and we want to focus on that. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you, you still have a few companies that are really um, troubled by the idea or um, don't understand the reasoning behind it, but they they usually get to a point where they say, well, it, it does make sense and I think we have to comply rather quickly. Um, but again, it depends certainly on the companies they're talking to. I have to say I'm, I'm impressed how it has changed over the last years. Um, it has gotten a lot better and a lot easier um, to sell compliance and to sell that they have um, to work on compliance. Um, most of them are really already at a point where they know they have to fix whatever issues they have um, and they just need to find a solution. So, so I, I mean, I, I'm certainly glad to hear that that things are changing. I, I tend to be an eternal pessimist and and think that think that think that it's not going to get better. Um, but I also want to th kind of throw the same question to John. I mean, John, do you feel like uh, that that at the end consumer level, you know, people who get these devices, do you feel that we've gotten we're getting to a point or moving towards a point where people feel empowered? Uh, like they do in the wireless router market, because most of the wireless routers, you can install an alternative firmware that's uh, completely free software. Uh, I know uh, from my work that that doesn't exist in any other sub industry. Do you see it moving in that direction? Is is Davide's dream getting there? Is Miriam right that the companies are moving or, or, or do we have a lot more work to do? And if so, what's that work, John? Uh, I think we have a lot more work to do. Um, I think that I agree uh, that there is much more widespread awareness. Uh, you can tell we're not in Brussels in January because I have the sun in my face. Uh, but yet you, there's much more widespread awareness of um, of free software and what it is, and uh, much greater willingness to use it and engage with it. I think I think that I do see um, the problem from a, a end user perspective is that there are so many other forces now pushing towards locking down devices. Uh, for different reasons, and also just so many more kinds of devices. So it's now not just can you rebuild the the software on your laptop or your uh, desktop or even your router, uh, but your phone. You know, if you have an iPhone which has free software on it, you can't really install your own. I mean, you can technically apply and be a developer and install some of your own software, but there's no way to have a marketplace for free software on that device because it's prohibited. Uh, and so there's a lot of other pressures working against user freedom. Uh, and that's one big area where we have a lot of work to do. So we have a the FSF, we have a certification program, Respects Your Freedom, where we're trying to promote uh, businesses that do embrace you know, fully 100% the notion that all the software on device should be free. Uh, when it comes to compliance, um, it's, you know, I, I do worry a bit about the kind of it's good enough, where our, our approach is good enough. Uh, we check enough of the boxes that we're going to reduce our risk, uh, and that's what we're aiming for. Uh, I would like to definitely see more adoption of the actual values behind all this, and just more understanding that most of these compliance challenges arise because of the common, because of the attempt to combine proprietary software and free software. So, you know, I really want to encourage people to push the envelope in the other direction 
as opposed to trying to see how much proprietary software you can get away with distributing alongside the free software with the free software, you know, push it in the other direction and see how much of your software you can distribute as free as a solution to the compliance challenges. It makes it a lot easier. And at the, so the risk is saying this is all Pidge's job to solve. Um, <laughs> like, I, I do want to ask Pidge, like, like how, like, how do you do that process with like a client? When a client comes to you and they're having embedded firmware and it's a mess and you're trying to tell them switch to Octo, do this. Um, are you able to get through to them uh, to the other side where there is a, the advantages and change them into that mature company that we've been talking about, get them to care about the end user installing it? Or, or, or do you, or do they just come to you and say, fix my problem so I don't have to think about it again? And I don't want, are they telling you, help us lock down your device? Are you having um, to push back with your clients about that? Yes and no. Um, I think that what a lot of the people that I have talked to, they understand that either this is the right thing to do, and not necessarily for moral or ethical reasons, but for entirely selfish reasons. Um, you see this kind of in in like some of the EU uh, things with Gaia X, where where they want privacy and open firmware all the way down to the chip level, um, because they don't necessarily trust close close binaries, close bulbs on the chip. They don't trust that. Um, so I think that from a lot of folks, you know, it's coming from either a, I never want to get that email from Bradley, uh, or I never want to do this where I get kind of called out for using open source software in my products and not doing it. So like most of the folks that are there aren't fighting this, right? Like the ones that I'm dealing with, but, but no, I'll, I'll asterisk that. Um, those are the folks who are coming to me already. So it's the ones that aren't coming to folks that are the ones that we worry about, right? Um, they're the ones who either don't think that they have a problem or don't know that they have a problem. Um, so the ones that I talk to are already on board. So, um, so I, I'm gonna, that brings me over to Davide uh, and, and probably ask the hard, hardest question that, that just has to be asked because Huawei is not a company that's known for its transparency. Uh, it's, it's had some, some trouble with that. It's, it's uh, been accused of, of, of spying. It's been accused of doing things in the firmware that we in the free software world have always argued. Well, if your software is free software, we can check and verify. Um, do you think that's going to be an argument going forward inside your company to say if 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 you if you do this and allow the users to rebuild and reinstall the firmwares on Huawei devices, uh, I, I would argue that it gives you uh, a great answer to the problems that Huawei has faced. But I, but I'd like to give you the opportunity to kind of address that and and how do you connect up the the transparency and other issues that Huawei has struggled with uh, with a, with the transparency and um, user freedom that is inherent in FOSS as you become an, a, a mature FOSS adopting organization? Yeah, I think the answer is all in, right? So it's, you know, it's Huawei in first person, right? If Huawei can be considered a person, juridical person, right? Uh, has been particularly hit by, you know, uh, services being, you know, pulled off or pulled away for the nature of known free services, right? So if you know you know a player in the industry feels that by using known free software then your business is going to be impacted then i mean you know let's use free software let's use open source software not only that if by using and by doing free software and participating in the community as an active open source citizen now all of the bad marketing that i'm getting right it's going to go away because i contribute first i participate second now all of a sudden i'm using technology that everybody uses and contributing technology to the world i'm not vendor locked in anymore my brand in terms of transparency uh protection of ip etc cetera, etc cetera, you know just gains value i mean all in Right. So, so in essence, that's the reason why my group was created. In essence, that's why after years and years and years of career in open source in, you know, many company in the U S and Europe, Huawei came to me and said, listen, we're all in in here. Can we build the open source technology center in Europe and be all in when it comes to open source, because it's good for us. It's strategic. It's good for the world. So let's go for it. Right. So I'm saying selfishly, selfishly open source is really good. It's the strategy. It's the real strategy. 
Okay, well, we're coming towards the end of the session. And so uh, so to make sure that everybody gets a chance to say what they want to say, I want to go through and give everybody a minute or so to say whatever, something I didn't ask as moderator that you really want to make, uh, make sure we covered or that you wanted to bring up. And I've been keeping track of people who've seen me looking over to their side about time. Miriam's had the, the least amount of time to speak. So I'm going to start with Miriam. Is there anything you wanted to say about FOSS compliance that we didn't get to? Um, yeah, one point I had been meaning to make before when you were asking uh, John and Pitch, actually, um, I think one thing that one development that I, I really like is that companies are looking a lot more into contributing back and getting engaged into open source software projects, um, not only using, but also looking at the other side. I think for many companies that still a bit harder um, to look into that and to figure out, you know, where do I get engaged? What makes sense? Um, where do I put my teams? Um, what do I look at? But it's happening a lot more. And at least we do get a lot more questions around that. And I think that's a good development in this space. Thank you. So, so John, do you, do you have anything that we, we didn't cover that you want to make sure was brought up? Um, yeah, I think that, that, you know, we're talking about compliance and in particular with copyleft. And I know that a lot of people uh, are talking about sustainability right now when it comes to the free software that they depend on, you know, learning that the projects they depend on are maybe only maintained actively by a couple of people and are in a kind of precarious situation. Uh, and I just want to emphasize how important we think copyleft is to sustainability. You know, copyleft is the thing that ensures that free software will be getting more free software uh, as opposed to, you know, more permissive licenses that put software out there that can then just be used to get proprietary software to market quicker. Uh, and that really undermines the sustainability of the whole system that, th that businesses are being built on. So you know, that was one thing I wanted to make sure was out there. And I just wanted to just offer our help at the FSF. I and mean, we do our best to maintain good uh, kind of best practice documentation, which helped establish community norms and make all this a lot clearer for people. Um, and uh, we do a lot of kind of unsung work for improving licensing hygiene and the projects that we notice. We even did a little bit with Big Blue Button actually to help them <laughs> clean up a few things with their licenses. So, you know, we're here to help. Um, you can always contact us at licensing at uh, And I really just want to encourage everybody to, to go as far as you can to push the envelope as, as far as you can. You know, don't lock down the device, even if you think you might be able to get away with it. Embrace the idea that people can do new and creative things with your products that will then probably benefit you uh, in the long run as well, as well as just being a socially responsible thing to do. Yeah. And I, I can't help but jump in to say that, uh, that, that free software uh, builds for devices make the devices life last longer and it's fewer devices ending up in landfills, which is another type of sustainability problem. And I want to go to Pidge and ask if there's anything you wanted to add that I didn't ask uh, or something about uh -huh. cost compliance you wanted to tell everybody? Um, no, but I do want a second thought um, in that if you are using open source and building a business on open source, it makes absolutely no sense from a business per perspective to starve open source. So if you are using a lot of open source and not contributing back either financially or patches welcome, um, start doing that now. Um, because, you know, it, it is a business sense thing. Um, it just makes business sense that it, um, on top of that, if I'm relying on things that from a security perspective that there's three people who work on the project and only one of them's getting paid to work on the project, that's an issue. And as open source, we need to get the larger uh, uh, utilizers of open source to start contributing back more and more. Davide, anything you wanted to make sure we covered that, that I didn't ask about? No, I think you asked all the hard questions. You gave me a chance to reply. So it's great. Thanks. So I'm just going to, you know, compliment what uh, was just said. Uh, when, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, contributing open source software, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, so business and ecosystems are created for, uh, ecosystems are created for business reasons. I mean, companies get together because there's a business sense. But because there's a business sense, uh, mature organization measure the number or the efficiency of a project in terms of decreasing contributions or increasing contribution. Meaning if I'm the first to start a project and I get a second partner, a third partner, fourth partner, fifth 
partner, right? I'm contributing 70%, 80%. Over time, I want to see that going down. I want to see that evenly distributed. Because if it's not evenly distributed, A, I'm the bully of the ecosystem. It's not open. I'm dominant. It's not good for marketing. And it's not efficient for me, right? So back to mature organization. It's about contribution. It's about being all in. And it's about sharing this burden together of contributing together and building something together, right? So that's how businesses think if they're mature enough. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to go around roundabout with everybody one last time and just give you a chance to say any URL or project that you want to promote to have people to look for further information. I'll start with uh, Miriam. Anything you want to promote or ask people to take a look at? Well, we actually had to have at least uh, one time um, someone saying you are on mute now. Um, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, now I have to think. There is actually a GDPR project that is open source. Um, I think it's the French, um, the French authority that's that's putting out a lot of open source software um, around GDPR compliance. So uh, maybe plug them because I think it's a good idea to to do that. John, is there anything uh, you want to give a URL or something to promote uh, for folks to take a look at? Oh, he's on mute now too. <laughs> Second time. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think the main thing is we will actually have an announcement shortly about a continuing legal education series online to go with our conference, Libra Planet, in March, um, and that's one place where we try to help uh, uh, lawyers, especially from uh, corporations, advance their skills in this area, and also get to spend some time talking with each other. So we're going to do an online version of that. Shortly, just watch FSF.org for more information. Pidge, uh, anything you want to promote uh, as we wrap up? Um, Yachter Project, as always, because I have to. Um, but also, uh, I'm working on a new project called Network Grade Linux. It's going to be announced in a few weeks. But um, it, 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 look look for that uh, coming out soon. And uh, Davide, you get the last word. Anything you want to promote uh, that you're working on that you want folks to take a look at? Yocto Project, Zephyr Project, Linux Foundation, Eclipse Foundation, Free Software Foundation, Open Harmony. You guys have funded FOSDEM, and that's it. You guys keep up the good work. This is going somewhere. I want to thank all our panelists uh, for doing this difficult, uh, difficult remote uh, panel, and we're so glad that you joined us. And uh, we hope that next year in Brussels we'll all be together and be able to go out to dinner after our panel then. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you, Bradley. Bye, guys. It was a pleasure. Bye.